Hi folks, welcome back. So this video is an extension of my last video which went into the basics of a differential amplifier. We looked at the basic operation of it and how and why it works. And this week I'm going to do a very quick recap of that video. Then we're going to do a simple alteration to that circuit and we're going to look at how that increases the performance of the simple differential amplifier and also gives it some useful features that we can take advantage of to make some more specialized audio circuitry things like VCAs, VCFs, and other generally voltage-controlled circuits. So let's start with a quick refresher. So this is our differential amplifier, and we looked last time at how this clever arrangement by connecting these two emitter resistors together means that this circuit responds differently to signals that are opposite on each side or sing signals that are the same on each side. So if we put a signal on the base of each of these two transistors and those two signals are 180 degrees out of phase with each other, then those two signals will oppose and cancel each other out perfectly at this point, assuming these transistors are very well matched. What this does is hold this point at a fixed point, essentially allowing us to view this point as a kind of virtual ground. What that means is essentially a point that we can just think of as a ground, um, even though it's not actually connected to ground. And what that does is it makes these two amplifier legs just look like a common emitter amplifier on either side, and we can just analyze it like a common emitter amplifier either side, the only difference being that only half of the input signal appears across either resistor, so we get this equation for the gain. Purely for the differential signals, the differential signals being the signals that are purely out of phase on either input. So when signals appear the same on both inputs, now these two signals are rising and falling together, so now they don't oppose each other at this point at all. In fact, they reinforce each other at this point. And what that does is bring this tail resistor into the gain equation. So now we have an equation for the common mode signals, which are the signals that appear on both sides. And this tail resistor tends to be very big, 10K or higher. We can see that this denominator is much bigger than this denominator. Therefore, the common mode gain is much smaller than the differential gain. And that's how we get these differential amplifiers to attenuate common mode signals at the same on both sides and amplify differential signals. And if you want to know more about that, go and check out my last video where I go into this in a lot more detail and we really look at the uh, circuit theory behind how we come to these two different equations. So m up until now, we've mostly been focusing on the gain equations and the resistors and the voltages. And what we're going to do now is we're going to talk about the currents and we're still going to talk about the gain because gain is very important we're going to talk about it in a more of a qualitative kind of relative way than, you know, coming up with specific equations and things like that. And how we're going to do that is we're going to look at the currents in this circuit, which is the one thing that we've not spoken that much about. Now, what we have spoken about is that for a purely differential signal, we're cancelling out any changes across here at this point. And we called this point my A point. I'll just label that again. If this point is fixed, then the voltage across this resistor is fixed then therefore the current through that resistor has to be fixed as well, right? Because the current through this resistor is just from Ohm's law, the voltage across it divided by the value of the resistor. So, because this resistor is in series with this entire circuit, the current that flows down a series path has to be the same through every component, right? So what I'm trying to say in a roundabout way is that the current across this resistor is all the current that's available for this entire circuit. What that implies is that neither transistor can try to draw more current than there is flowing through this resistor, right? So the maximum extreme we can get is no current flowing through one and all of the current flowing through the other. And that therefore limits the maximum voltage swing that either one of these can reach. So let's just say, um, I'll use some simple numbers here. Let's say you've got two milliamps flowing through here. That means that with no input signals applied, we've got one milliamp flowing through either of these. And so we would then pick these collector resistors to set either output or both outputs if you wanted to take the output from both. So again, just use some round numbers. I won't use nine volts because it's a bit of an awkward number. So let's say we've got 20 volts and minus 20 volts, just use some really round numbers. We've got one milliamp through each. So let's say these are both 5K and then that will drop one milliamp times 5K is five volts. So the output here will sit at 15 volts. So this means that we can draw no more than two milliamps through either transistor. And if we try to draw any more than that, then the output will just clip. So say we start at one milliamp, we can go up to two milliamps or down to zero milliamps. 
And so that sets our maximum voltage swing at 10 volts. And if we try to swing any more than that, so say we were, that's 10 volts. And if we tried to draw any more than that, it would just clip. When we are drawing the full two milliamps through this one, there's nothing left for this one. So as this one draws two milliamps, 10 volts gets dropped across this. So this collector drops from 20 volts down to 10 volts or from 15 volts down to 10 volts. And seeing as there's no current left to drop any voltage across this resistor, then this collector rises to 20 volts. So there you can see how that symmetrical sharing of the current um, is what gives the differential amplifier that symmetrical output. So hopefully then it's simple to see how if we just decrease the available amount of current, the less and less voltage swing we're going to be able to get because the voltage swing is just however much current you've got here times this resistor. So if we decrease or increase the available amount of current, we decrease or increase the maximum voltage swing at the output and therefore the gain of the circuit. So here's a simple differential amplifier just like last time, only I'm going to replace our tail resistor with a potentiometer down to 9 volts. And so by putting a potentiometer down here, now I can vary the resistance, which enables me to vary the current because that voltage remains approximately constant, doesn't it? Okay, so if we look on the scope now, what we can see as I vary this potentiometer, I'm changing the gain, look. So here we've got, we're at 200 millivolts per division, so we're about 800 millivolts peak to peak and as I vary this about what's that a thousand millivolts peak to peak and if I turn it the other way now we're just under that 800 millivolts peak to peak we were at earlier let's set this to our maximum gain so to get maximum gain or maximum current and to get maximum current we've now got a very small resistor here haven't we effectively I've got this re resistor turned all the way down so now let's see what happens when I turn my common mode signal back on Wah, wah, wah. We can see here that we've added an extra feature. We can now control the gain of our amplifier, but at the expense of one of the most useful features of our differential amplifier. In order to get more differential gain, we need a more current. To get more current, we reduce the size of this resistance. But reducing the size of this resistance increases the common mode gain. Remember before we had a common mode gain of about a half. Now we've got a common mode gain approaching one, maybe even more than one. I don't know exactly what this resistor is set to, but we could actually be amplifying the noise now instead of reducing it. What would be great is if we could find a way of controlling this tail current without the voltage changing at all. Is there a way we can get the best of both worlds? Well, you've probably guessed that I wouldn't be making a video about it if there wasn't. So let's go find out what it is. So what we need is some sort of circuit that acts like a battery does for voltage, but for currents. A battery supplies a constant voltage for a range of currents. We need some circuit that can provide a constant current over a range of voltage. A battery is a voltage source. What we need is a current source. Unfortunately for us, we're already pros at designing current sources and we don't even know it yet. So let's replace this resistor with a very simple current source. You can design much more complicated current sources than this, but we're going to start with a, the simplest one I can muster. The simplest form of a current source it's just a single transistor like this. And we know that as long as we keep the collector higher than the base and the base higher than the emitter, then the transistor will constantly supply the current that is developed by this emitter voltage across this emitter resistor. We've done this a thousand times, haven't we? And this works perfectly for our circuit. There will be some small changes in current due to changes in voltage here due to a thing called the early effect. But just for those who are interested, the early effect of why these curves aren't flat. If there was no change in current due to change in voltages, then those transistor curves would be completely flat. But they're not, but the changes are very small, so we don't need to worry about it for these simple circuits. So why don't we build this circuit up? Okay, so here's that circuit built up as well. So we can see on the oscilloscope, we've got that pure differential signal in yellow and the output signal in blue, which is just the output of one of our collectors, same as we always have done. And you can see we've got that gain nice and dialed in exactly how we had before. But this time, when I turn on the common mode signal, this isn't just as good as it was with the resistor. This is actually much better because remember, if we think about the collector of that transistor, the collector current barely changes over a quite a wide range of voltages. So if you imagine that that was a resistor, which is what it looks like to the rest of the circuit, it must look like a very big resistor, mustn't it? Because if we had an ordinary resistor and we changed the voltage by loads and the current barely changed at all, 
that would have to be a very large resistor. And so essentially the collector of this transistor looks like a huge resistance. So the equation with the R tail in the bottom, if that looks like a huge resistor now, then that common mode gain is going to be very small. And so we can see here, even with ludicrous amounts of noise, there's none. I haven't turned that signal off. I've just hidden it from the oscilloscope. It's still there, but there's none at the output. That's how good a current source these transistors are. And this is one of the best and kind of most undervalued use of a transistor we, in electronics. We talk about voltage sources all the time, but I feel like current sources are a really underrated circuit. So there's one final kind of issue with this circuit that I want to go over with you guys, which is that. So until now, you can see I've had the scope AC coupled. So what that's doing, the oscilloscope is removing any DC offset. So as I change the gain of this, you can see it kind of shifts around and then oscilloscope removes the offset. But if I take this off of AC coupling, to where this little blue ticker is now, that's ground there. And so we can see the gain changing there. Kind of hard, harder to see because we're a lot more zoomed out, but you can see the top is getting closer to the bottom, but also the DC offset changes along with the gain. And so that DC offset it's not a good thing. We don't want DC offsets being passed through our circuitry. It might upset future stages and things like that. We, we want things to kind of stay around ground unless we specifically design them not to. What can we do about this? If we actually have a look at both collectors now together, this is both of the collectors superimposed on top of each other. And as I vary the gain, we can see the collectors move around together. And so if we look at these signals, the answer to this problem is kind of obvious. We've got two signals 180 degrees out of phase with each other, and they've got some common offset that we want to get rid of. So the answer to this problem, how do we get rid of this offset, is another differential amplifier. We can put the output of this, these two collectors, into a second differential amplifier, and then we will get the output with that DC offset removed. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to build this circuit up, and I'll include this in the schematics, but I have to keep the kind of pacing of these videos up a little bit. I'll upload the details of how I designed this second differential amp onto my Patreon. So if you're really interested, do check it out there. Let's have a look at this full VCA fully built up. So what we've got, this is what we had before. So this is our differential amplifier from before, and this is our current source from before, just the same. What I've done is I've added a second differential amplifier here. And I've taken the output from both collectors and fed it into both inputs of our second differential amplifier. And then what I've got, all these transistors and diodes and things, looks a lot more complicated than it is. Over here, we've got a fixed current source for this second differential amplifier because we don't want to change the gain of that. And this transistor here, this is just a simple common emitter amplifier. So this is an output gain stage. And then we've got two... Um, emitter follower output buffers. One's a PMP transistor and one's an NPN transistor. So they allow us to have a low impedance output for the positive swings and for the negative swings. So you'll see that all on the schematic. And just to point something out quite interesting about this circuit, all this stuff here, this is essentially an op amp. What we've done is we've essentially made an op amp here. An op amp has a differential amplifier on the input and then it has a gain stage and then it has an emitter follower output stage. So what we've actually done here is we've built an op amp on the breadboard and you could replace all of this with an op amp if that's what you wanted to do. I'm going to go into a whole video designing an op amp from scratch in a couple of weeks time so keep an eye out for that. So let's have a look at how this circuit works. So what I've got up on the oscilloscope here, this yellow signal is the collect one of the collectors of the first differential amplifier and this blue signal is the ultimate output. As I change the current through the current source, more or less current is dropped across these collectors, right, which changes the ultimate gain. Now the problem was, remember, that as the gain changed, so did the bias point. So the bias point would slide up and down. It might be a little bit hard to see on the screen there, but that signal gets larger, but the bias moves down. And as I decrease the current, the signal shrinks and the bias point moves up, right, until it's completely gone there. And so this was a problem, right? We don't want the output moving up and down like this because that could affect whatever circuit comes after this. So we've essentially used our second differential amplifier to remove that. And let me now show you the two signals together. 
So this blue signal is this blue cable down here and this is all the way out of the output of these two transistors. That output sits perfectly around ground. You'll notice there's no capacitors here. There's no capacitors removing any DC offsets, but you can see the amount of DC offset, the changing DC offset, and that yellow signal is being completely removed and that blue signal sits perfectly around ground and we can see that gain varying with the current source. And let's have a listen. The eagle-eyed among you will have noticed that what usually happens when I turn my loudspeakers on is that the signal gets attenuated an insane amount. But we can see we've got such a low impedance output here with these, we've got one ohm resistors at the output that this can drive this low impedance loudspeaker no problem whatsoever. I think what's cool to know is how clean it sounds as we change the gain. But usually where we'd hear distortion in an amplifier like this is as we cut the amplifier off because we're just using transistors as we go below that VBE threshold, the transistor turns off, that's a non-linear process, so it sounds distorted. But with this, because of the way we're doing it, there's barely any distortion down there at all. It sounds really clean all the way down to no volume. In videos to come, when we look at op amps specifically, and we look at feedback, we can find ways to take amplifiers and improve their frequency response even more, so we get no appreciable distortion. This is pretty good considering how simple this circuit is. Let's try it with some different waveforms. You can see it performs exactly the same with a triangle wave. And I think using the square wave highlights how good it is having an amplifier with no capacitors in it. Because before, when we built amplifiers with capacitors in it, there's a low frequency limit to how low we can go. So if you were using this for, say, a, an LFO, a low frequency oscillator, you might want to go down to sub hertz. And if you'd done that with one of my previous amplifiers, you would have had to use an outrageously large capacitor. And so what I've got here, this is a 0.5 hertz square wave. And when we look on the oscilloscope, we'll see that there's no rounded edges, no low frequency attenuation whatsoever. We can see that those waves the yellow wave is the input wave and the blue wave is the output wave and they look as crisp and sharp as the day they were born. <laughs> so that's all for this week, folks. For my patrons, I'm going to upload a kind of sister video to this video going into a kind of more involved design. So if you're into these types of things, you found this video interesting, maybe consider heading over to my Patreon and supporting me there. If not, please leave a like comment, share, subscribe, ring the bell, all that stuff. But most importantly, come back next time where we're going to be doing into more audio circuitry and building our own synthesizers. See you then. Bye bye.